We've all heard the saying, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. In these very odd days of the coronavirus, there's been a lot of consolidation of power by uh, uh, governments and states and governors, and even local uh, uh, towns for mayors. And there's been a lot of valid concern about the trajectory of this power. If states take this power because of an emergency, will they return it? The video that's about to follow is a lecture from Old Western Culture from the uh, series on the Romans covering the works of Cicero. And a decent portion of the lecture is dedicated to the story of Cincinnatus, a 5th century BC Roman who was, giving, who was given dictatorial power for six months to fend off an invasion. He accepted the responsibility of dictator and in two weeks quelled the rebellion and handed the power back to the Senate. He was well known for this and it embodied what it meant, the ideals of being a Roman. And this was um, held as a virtue, of course, in the Roman period, but specifically by our founding fathers. Uh, so many of them uh, uh, read Cicero um, and would quote them at length and verbatim. It was Cicero and the Roman authors in general were very important to our founding fathers in establishing the ideals that, found, that founded the American Constitution and the American Republic. Uh, to the point that George Washington was called the Cincinnatus of the West. And he represented these Roman ideals. And it wasn't just that he happened to or he knew the stories. He did so in a very overt fashion. I'm going to read a quote from the uh, uh, author Carl Richard, who wrote a book called The Founders and the Classics. Um, he's pointing out this interaction between uh, George III and the American War for Independence as related to... Um, uh, the, this American ideal of the classics. He said, an astonished Western world agreed with the judgment of George III, unable to believe that any military leader would voluntary, voluntarily surrender such power. The king scoffed that if Washington resigned his commission, he would be the greatest man in the world. The king's confusion epitomized his inability throughout the revolutionary conflict to comprehend the enormous emotional power which the classical Republican ideals wielded over American minds. He goes on to say that Washington did not want to declare defeat uh, at the worst points of the war because he did not want the priv to, to lose the privilege of laying down his arms, uh, of laying down his, his uh, uh, of si um, um, giving in his commission. And so he resigned from public life after the war, did not take the title of king. Um, this is a very important story for us as Americans today because I think we're focusing too much on the power being taken instead of the fact that um, power being taken by a ruler, the real virtue of a ruler is to return the power. So we might not agree that it needs to be taken in the first place. Some people are saying too much is being taken for no reason. Others are saying not enough is being being done. But no matter the, 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 the case, the true virtue will be whether these, um, these government entities will be like Cincinnati, will be like George Washington. Will they resign their commission? Will they return power to the Senate? Or will they say, this power, we, we like it and we're going to keep it? And that's what I think we should be focused on and what we need to call our, our leaders accountable to is... Um, um, uh, times of war, times of extreme hardship, you have these powers and it will be, you will be judged and be virtuous based on whether you return that power after the conflict is over. Enjoy this lecture. This is one of my favorite lectures. I love the, uh, the, the Roman history um, that, that comes out of it and its comparisons to the American founding and how these ideas um, conscientiously molded the American mind. The, the American founding fathers didn't happen to be classical edu classically educated. They viewed their classical education as essential to the founding of our country. So enjoy this lecture by Wes Callahan from Old Western Culture, the Romans, on uh, the works of Cicero.
Welcome back to Old Western Culture, uh, our series of discussions on the great books of the Western world. Uh, and in particular now, we're on Roman literature, and uh, the Roman historians uh, is the unit that we're discussing, the, the, that we're going through now. And we've been talking about Livy. In the last lecture, I discussed book one of Livy's early history of Rome. And we talked about how Livy is another one of these uh, first century BC conservatives like Virgil, who has lived through a time of, uh, of uh, civil chaos and, and, and disorder and civil war, uh, a civil war that was brought to an end by Caesar Augustus, uh, earning him then the respect and love and honor of many uh, conservatives like, uh, uh, like uh, Virgil uh, and Livy, who remember and long for uh, a more stable, more prosperous time, a time when people had more integrity, when the Romans were more moral, when they were, there was less corruption and vice. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> uh, in Livy's uh, early history of Rome here, he began, as I mentioned last time, he began by talking about how there's a value in going back and studying the early history of the country because we can see then how men used to be more upright, more full of integrity, how they practiced the virtues of courage and honor and thrift and, uh, and nobility and so on, uh, and um, how uh, the study of history can provide for us a set of examples to imitate so that we can make our own lives better. And history provides perspective so that we need not be discouraged and depressed by the moral corruption and the bleakness of the degeneracy we see in the culture around us. And so there's some very obvious parallels for us in America today. Those of us who consider ourselves cultural conservatives, that is, uh, we long for the goods that the past had uh, to be preserved. Now there's parallels. We tend to be sick at heart when we look at the degeneracy uh, around us uh, in, in the culture today, exaggerated as it is, of course, by the media, but it's a very real degeneracy and corruption, and we tend to be discouraged. But history, the study of history, says Livy, is the best medicine for a sick mind, for in it you find the infinite variety of human experience plainly set out for all to see, and in that record you can find for yourself and your country examples, find things to imitate and base things to avoid. And he asks us to consider the lives, the character of the men uh, who uh, determined the course of Roman history so that we uh, can imitate their character and so on. He told the story in book one about Romulus, the first king of Rome, a descendant of Aeneas. Romulus founds the city of Rome in 753 BC, and it's a monarchy. For 250 years, there are kings governing Rome. At first, they're pretty good. Romulus popula populates the city with, uh, um, with uh, basically a criminal class. Uh, an outcast class of society, but they, uh, after a rather inauspicious beginning by seizing some uh, local girls to make them their wives, things settle down. Uh, everybody eventually settles down to contentment and the city grows. And after 250 years, the city is prosperous, it's wealthy, it's powerful, and it's holding its own against its hostile neighbors. At the end of that 250 time, uh, year time period in 509 BC, uh, the Roman uh, kings uh, in the last few decades having been more oppressive and tyrannical than previously, the Romans have a revolution and they throw off the Etruscan kings, driving them from the city, and they found a republic, 509 BC. And so now we have the beginning of the great Roman Republic and the rise of the Roman Empire. Uh, and this takes us to the beginning uh, of, our, uh, of the books uh, that uh, we'll be talking about today, the beginning of book two. At the beginning of book two, just as at the beginning of book one, uh, Livy, our historian, steps back and he makes some editorial comments. He does a little bit of philosophizing uh, and it's very valuable to read. He says, My task from now on will be to trace the history in peace and, uh, and of a free nation governed by annual elected officers of state and subject not to the caprice of individual men, but to the overriding authority of law. So there's the first principle to pay attention to. He says, I'm about to start discussing the history of a free nation, not governed by kings. And specifically here, he says, not subject to the caprice of individual men, but to the overriding authority of law. And this is a, a very important point. From now on, the Romans become a nation that understands the value of transcendent law as the government of a people. Law becomes no longer the whim of a king, a king whose caprice might cause him to hate you one day when he loved you the previous day. Uh, uh, the, the sort of whim and caprice of a governor uh, who uh, can change his mind and, uh, and, and consequently gives you no security. Uh, if the law, if the law of the land is whatever the king says it is, uh, then because his moods change, the laws may change and no one can be really safe from the moods of a capricious king. But if everyone, including the king, 
is under the authority of a law that transcends us all. If everyone is subject to the law, then there's some security. Because then if, uh, if uh, uh, the, the, uh, the lower people are oppressed by the higher people, they can appeal in a court of law to the law that everyone is over. <clears throat> uh, in theory. Now, of course, this can be abused, uh, but this is a principle that all of Western civilization has been based on ever since, and is certainly a principle uh, of American, uh, the American understanding of law, that we're all equal before the law, even the highest people in the land, and therefore, uh, those of us who are not the highest people in the land have recourse when we feel we've been, uh, uh, we've been oppressed. So the law is transcendent, it's higher than everyone, and this, uh, and this is what Livy is pointing to here. The Romans and the Republic uh, are, uh, have discovered, or at least are enacting, a principle of transcendent law, and so law is not the whim of the ruler. And then in the second paragraph, he says something else interesting. Uh, he says um, <clears throat> uh, that um, uh, uh, if the people of Rome had thrown off the monarchs too soon, uh, unrestrained by the power of the throne, they would no doubt have set sail on the stormy sea of democratic politics, swayed by the gusts of popular eloquence, and quarreling for power with the governing class of a city which did not even belong to them before any real sense of community had had time to grow. That sense, the only true patriotism, comes slowly and springs from the heart. It is founded upon respect for the family and love of the soil. Premature liberty of this kind would have been a disaster. We should have been torn to pieces by petty squabbles before we had ever reached political maturity, which, as things were, was made possible by the long, quiet years under monarchical government. For it was that government which, as it were, nursed our strength and enabled us ultimately to produce sound fruit from liberty, as only a politically adult nation can. In this a very important passage, Livy says a number of very significant things. Number one, he says, if we had had a revolution and thrown off the monarchy too soon, before we had grown to political liberty and understanding, political maturity, that is, and understanding, it would have been a disaster. We would have torn ourselves apart just the way some children uh, 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 might have done, supposing that they had managed to uh, elude their parents and start their own little household. As odd as that might, might seem, that's the, that's the an analogy. Uh, a child of seven cannot govern himself. His father imposes authority and government on him. By the time the child is 17 or 18, uh, most parents consider their children uh, old enough and mature enough and independent enough and self-disciplined enough to be on their own. And so they can go off to college or get a job, maybe even get married. Uh, but uh, those are things the parent would, no sane parent would let a child do at six or seven or eight. And so Livy says, during the long, peaceful years under the monarchy, though the monarchs were authoritarian, they were like fathers, enabling us to, protecting us, enabling us to grow up to maturity under them until we were of age. And by the time these monarchs uh, began to be despotic themselves, we had enough understanding as a people that we could govern ourselves, but we didn't have that understanding earlier. And this also is a principle that the founding fathers of America appealed to. The American colonies were British colonies. We were British America for nearly 200 years before the American Revolution. From the early 1600s until the late 1700s, we lived under the uh, benign patronage, mostly benign patronage, of the British monarch. And because of the oversight of the British monarch, who was sort of the father figure, uh, the patriarch of the colonies, uh, the, the, uh, the American colonists lived in peace and they grew in political understanding. And by the time we come to the, to the American Revolution, uh, whatever we think of that a, a revolution, the founding fathers thought that the American people were capable now of governing, them, uh, governing themselves. We'd grown up to maturity. We'd reached 18. If we had tried to have a revolution and overthrown uh, the uh, Stuart monarchs of, say, the late 1600s, 100 years earlier than we actually did, uh, it might have been a disaster. We would have fallen apart. We didn't have enough experience. We hadn't lived long enough uh, uh, enjoying the fruits of peace under a king and learning what uh, uh, civil order looked like, and we would have imploded. So the Founding Fathers lo uh, looked to this passage for, uh, um, uh, for vindication of where we were as a country. And then he says this, uh, <clears throat> we would have, uh, uh, we would have uh, um, uh, destroyed ourselves because we'd had no chance to grow a real sense of community. That sense he says, the only true patriotism comes slowly and springs from the heart. In other words, it takes time. It is founded upon respect for the family and love of the soil. 
Respect for the family and love of the soil, he said, are the two principles upon which patriotism grows. Patriotism is not an abstract thing. It's not just a word. It comes from being anchored in the soil, from knowing the land that you lived on and your families lived on for generations, for feeling a deep loyalty to the countryside, to the parish, to the village, to the community, to these woods, to this river, to these meadows. And then, if suddenly you find uh, your, your country threatened, uh, you're defending something very specific and real and concrete, something with a picture in your mind. These woods, this river, these trees, this forest, this village. So patriotism comes from love of the soil and from respect for the family. If the family's lived on the land for a long time and you walk through the manorial uh, manse and in the uh, hall of portraits, there's a picture of great, great granddaddy so-and-so glowering down at you uh, over his uh, huge handlebar mustache. And your parents see, say, there's your great grandfather. He did this and this, and he fought in this war and that war. And over there is your great uncle and he did this and that. And here's your older brother who did these things. And, you, and the memories of what your family has done are embedded in you, uh, are, are in your bones, uh, that produces patriotism as well. And so um, <clears throat> if we think about it, uh, over the 250 years of, uh, of the period of the monarchy, the Romans uh, have uh, developed something interesting that's about to become a critical factor. The people who could stay on the land for a long time, families who keep the land in the family for generations, become more wealthy. They build the, 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 uh, the, the ancestral manse, they build the mansion, they acquire titles of nobility. The people who, through whatever fortunes and, and, and fate, are, are not enabled to do this, uh, never make much money, have to keep moving to find jobs, never put down roots in the country because they have to move generation after generation to, to, make, a, to make a living. They have to move to the city, they have to move to another part of the country. Um, and consequently, they also break ties with the family. If you're not always living around your family, around your kin, that, that, that weakens those ties. And so they become the lower class, whereas the people who are able, uh, able to maintain the roots in the soil become the upper class. And so we have uh, two groups of people growing now in Roman culture that become a, 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 an important factor in the, re, in the remaining story. The patricians, or the aristocrats, the upper class, the nobility, and the plebeians, or the lower class, the commons, the average, uh, the average person. The patricians are the ones who've been able to sink their roots in the soil and establish themselves, make some money, and then pass on the soil and the money and the, and the, and the memory of the family and the, and the genealogy to generation after generation. It's generally aristocratic families who do have better memories about their ancestors. Uh, us commoners uh, often like to do genealogy. We like to dig into the past and find out who our ancestors are, but it's harder work because we've traveled. We've been dispersed over the earth looking for freedom, looking for job opportunities, looking for, uh, for political stability. And so we've broken our ties with the old homelands and with the old family, and it's harder for us. But the aristocrats who can sink their roots into the soil, build on the land, and then generation after generation can remain there, they tend to remember their families better. And so they're the ones, the aristocrats are the ones in whom this loyalty, this patriotism first grows. They're the ones who own property, real estate, and money, and therefore have something genuine at stake if bad political decisions are made or a neighboring uh, kingdom attacks. They have something to lose. The poor people, the commoners, uh, don't have land to lose, don't have a huge bank account to lose. They, they have their lives to lose, or at least their liberty. But the aristocrats have more material things to lose, and so in them, this patriotism grows and, and, and feels very real. Later on in British history, we're going to see this, this very concept espoused by a man called the father of modern conservatism, a guy named Edmund Burke, who lives in the late 1700s. Uh, one of the last real exponents of the old Western culture, as C.S. Lewis calls it. Edmund Burke, living in the late 1700s, uh, is a great enemy of the French Revolution, where all the old traditions, the old monarchies, the old aristocracies, the old patterns and customs of life are being torn up by the roots and destroyed. And many people in England are tempted to follow the French way of uh, th this French revolutionary uh, mode of, of being, thinking that perhaps this is what we need. We need a, a revolution. Overthrow the past and start all over from scratch. And Burke says, no, that's wrong. That would be a terrible idea. Uh, and he appeals to the aristocrats, though he himself is not one, and he says that the aristocrats are the great oaks that shade the land because they've been around for a long time, they have longer memories, they have the money and the leisure to think about things, to become philosophical and to pursue the liberal arts and so on, uh, gain a greater experience of life in the world. 
Whereas the rest of us commoners have to scrabble for a living all the time and don't have time to read the great books, don't have time to go to liberal arts colleges, don't have time to grow in the experience of the world, don't have time to sit and think with a pen in your hand and a notebook under your, and under your wrist. We have to work all the time. So Burke says, aristocracies have their problems, but they do, are, they do turn out to be the element of stability in a country. Well, that's what Livy is saying here. He's saying patriotism grows slowly. It's founded on respect for the family and love of the soil, two things that are most commonly found among the aristocrats. So uh, 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 he says, um, <clears throat> these things have grown among a certain class of the people. The, 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 the patricians have developed this love of the country, this love of the soil, this love of the family, and they are the patriots. Now, the common people, of course, love their country, but they don't have as much to lose, and they haven't developed this patriotism, patriotism quite as much. Well, now, uh, Livy uh, talks about this new republic that's growing. Uh, in this republic, this conservative attitude on the part of the patricians that wants to preserve uh, the good things they've developed over the previous 250 years uh, causes them to uh, develop a republic and not a democracy. Um, <clears throat> in a republic... We have the chance to preserve uh, uh, old traditions. We have the chance to preserve things that don't, don't need to be destroyed. And so in the Republic, there are some new features of government that we associate with Roman history. And the first one is the Senate. The Senate uh, is, uh, takes its name from the Roman word for the aged, for the elderly. Uh, senectus means uh, old age. Senex means an old man. Senate is the council of the elderly, uh, the more experienced, the whiteheads among us. That's the Senate. Uh, and we continue in our American form of government to have uh, a body of men called senators taken from this, uh, from this Roman idea. Uh, our country actually has two houses. We have the Senate and the House of Representatives. Uh, but if you look at your constitution, the Senate requires uh, uh, greater age, more experience uh, than the House of Representatives does. So our, our Senate is the wiser, theoretically, older, more experienced men of the land. And we've drawn this from the Roman uh, uh, experience. So that for the Romans, the Senate is a council of, uh, uh, of wise men elected from among the patrician class. Men who have wisdom, men who have understanding, men who have age, and significantly, men who have wealth and something to lose if things go wrong. So they're, they're more likely to be cautious. From the Senate, two men are chosen to govern every year to be the executives. They're called the consuls. And so from now on, for hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years, really, uh, the Roman Republic uh, uh, has, the, uh, has consuls. Uh, there are two consuls uh, who serve every year together, jointly, and they serve for a term of one year, and then they can no longer serve. So term limits. Uh, so the consuls have great power, but because the Romans now are fearful of the kind of absolute power that became despotic under the monarchy, they want to put a buffer between men and power. And, the, and some of the restraints, the checks on power that the, these consuls have are, number one, they only serve for a year. Number two, they have to share power uh, with, uh, uh, with, a, um, with another consul. And number three, they're given different roles. One consul generally serves uh, as uh, in charge of the military. Another consul generally stays home and, 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 uh, and governs civil affairs. But the last check uh, is that they're still subject to the will of the Senate. Um, <clears throat> so they have a lot of power, but they no longer have absolute power. So we have the Senate and we have consuls, but they're all from the patrician class. It's going to be some time, as we see in Livy, before the commons finally start saying, hey, don't we get a, a representative voice in the Senate? Uh, and a new position will be, uh, uh, will be um, uh, invented called the Tribune, who represents the, the common classes. But at first, it's only the, the, uh, the patricians. Uh, there's another uh, position that Livy tells us is invented uh, in Roman government that becomes very important in later Roman history, and that's the censor. The censor is an official who, as the word suggests, takes the census. But this is important because the government needs to know what its resources are, how many people there are, and therefore how many uh, men of military age there are, what kind of resources there are to be taxed, and so on. And, uh, significantly, the census or the or the, the censor is in charge of uh, uh, of um, identifying what per, what people belong to what class, and so he's uh, uh, he has a great deal of say uh, over the social order because he identifies the class to which you belong. Uh, so the censor uh, is uh, uh, the position of censor is invented and becomes very powerful in later Roman history. And so now uh, we have the Ro Roman Republic beginning. Uh, we have also the beginning, as I've described. 
of potential conflict, which will become real conflict before long between these two classes, the upper class of patricians and the lower class of plebeians. It's not going to be long before there's conflict. The patricians will be taking advantage of the lower class, uh, the lower class will be upset and rebellious against the upper class and so on. But before that happens, the Roman people are fairly unified with each other. There's a certain amount of brotherly love going on. Uh, and uh, the Roman country being small, they're forced to band together and, be, and, and uh, uh, be of one mind in order to protect themselves from their neighbors who surround them. Remember that at this point, Rome is still just a city and a little territory around it. Rome doesn't own the entire peninsula of, of Italy, much less the entire Mediterranean world as it will later. Rome is just a little city, and so the, the, uh, its neighbors, uh, all the surrounding nations, uh, feel like they can take advantage of this new country that has thrown off its kings and seems vulnerable. In fact, one of the nearby neighbors that is particularly hostile and a real problem for a while is, uh, uh, is, is, a, uh, is a kingdom governed by the former kings of Rome who would like to get Rome back, these uh, Etruscan kings, the Tarquins. And so uh, the, the early history of Rome as described in the rest of book two is the beginning of Rome's conf armed conflict with its neighbors as the neighbors keep attacking and Rome ke has to keep fending them off, ke uh, has to continue stiff, ar uh, stiff arming the neighboring county. And so there are a number of uh, Roman heroes from early Roman history that exemplify this great Roman spirit. Uh, one of them, one of the most famous, is a man named Horatius. Uh, Horatius, uh, uh, one, perhaps uh, one of the two most famous Roman heroes from early Roman history. The story that Livy tells us uh, is that um, uh, uh, the neighboring king, Lars Porcina, uh, one of these neighboring Etruscans, attacks Rome. Uh, Horatius and a couple of his friends um, agree to defend, uh, to, to, to stand guard and defend the bridge that crosses the Tiber River into the gate of Rome while the Romans hew down the bridge so the enemy can't cross the bridge and get in. And so Horatius and his buddies are going to stand on the far side of the bridge, on the enemy side, and hold off the enemy while the bridge is cut down, and then they'll have to find some way to get back in the city. Uh, 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 Horatius tells his friends, you guys go on back, you defend the other side, I can stand here and, 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 uh, and fend off the enemy. And so uh, in the story, Horatius single-handedly defends the bridge. The bridge is hewn down. Uh, Horatius then... Uh, bloodied and, and wounded from the onslaught of the enemy, um, uh, but undaunted nevertheless, jumps into the river, swims across, climbs up to the gate, and, and uh, gets back into the city of Rome to the accolades of his countrymen, and is honors, uh, honored as a hero. Um, <clears throat> he, he was willing to sacrifice his life for the city, and this is the spirit of Romanitas. This is the spirit of Romanness that we talked about uh, when we were discussing the Aeneid in previous lectures. Now, this story is so famous and so popular uh, and, and so uh, constantly repeated in later Roman history that it continued to be a famous story in Western culture. Uh, and um, as evidence of this, there was a famous poem written by a man named Thomas Macaulay in the early 1800s uh, called Horatius at the Bridge. It's a famous poem uh, and it tells the story in ballad style uh, and it, uh, uh, it really brings out the glory and the nobility that the Romans saw in this story. Uh, uh, in it you see patriotism, in it you see the breathless uh, anticipation of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, the, of the danger that threatens from outside. And then when Horatius finally wins the day and saves Rome, uh, the clamor of, of, of applause uh, and later on the near idol, idolization of Horatius by the Romans. And uh, his, lips on the, on, uh, uh, his, his name on the lips of mothers and fathers uh, for generations to come as they put their children to bed telling the story of Horatius, hoping that their young sons will grow up to be like him. And so if you get a chance to take a look at this poem, uh, it's a lovely poem. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a delightful poem. Uh, Winston Churchill is said to have loved this poem and to have memorized it when he was a schoolboy. And for the rest of his life, uh, it, it, it took but a nudge uh, of Churchill at a party to get him to recite the poem, probably to many people's consternation. Oh no, there goes Winston Churchill again, reciting Horatius at the Bridge. But it was, uh, th this testifies to its popularity as a school memorization piece. And so the story lives on. Another one of the great heroes told about in book two uh, is a man named Mucius. Uh, Mucius uh, was part of a conspiracy of a several hundred young men who agreed to try to sneak into the camp of the enemy and assassinate the leader, uh, you know, chop off the tallest head of the poppy. Mucius is captured, taken to the leader, and he's threatened with torture. Uh, and he says, 
you really think that scares me? And he holds out his right hand and puts it into the burning fire be, uh, before him. And while everyone watches horrified, his flesh bubbles and burns away. And he stares them in the eye and says, I don't fear your torture. And there's 300 more like me back in Rome waiting to come and do the same thing again. Uh, and uh, this uh, obviously impresses the enemy um, that the, uh, the uh, resistance they're going to meet in Rome is much worse uh, than they had thought. Uh, there, uh, here again, there's a modern echo of this. Uh, some of you may be familiar, uh, uh, if you've lived long enough, uh, with the Watergate scandals of the early 1970s when President Richard Nixon uh, was uh, put out of office because of, an, of his involvement. The scandal uh, concerned uh, some, uh, uh, some people working for the Republican political party in the U.S. back in Washington, D.C., who were spying illegally on the Democratic Party and got caught. But one of the men who was behind putting together this Republican conspiracy was a man named G. Gordon Liddy, uh, who, along with uh, a man named Chuck Colson, uh, was putting to together this conspiracy. Now, later on, Chuck Colson famously became a Christian while he was in prison for his political crimes and became a famous Christian author. Uh, Gordon Liddy, after his prison uh, stint, uh, became a famous radio talk show host, kind of like Rush Limbaugh. Uh, but at the height of the conspiracy, when Liddy and Colson were putting together this Republican conspiracy, uh, Liddy is said to have met young men that he think would he thought would be good candidates uh, for their operations uh, in restaurants, and there he would talk to them and see if they really would be committed to the cause. And the story goes that he would uh, he would look them in the eye across the uh, table in this dimly lit Italian restaurant or French restaurant. He would look at them across the candle and say, are you, are, are you ready to work for us? And they'd say, why, yes, Mr. Liddy, I am. And he said, no. I mean, are you really committed? And he'd hold out his hand, palm down, with the tip of the flame of the candle in the middle of the table in those little red glass votive uh, uh, candle holders. And he'd hold it there while the young man stared transfixed as the flesh started to blister on Liddy's palm. And Liddy would say, I mean, are you this committed to us? So uh, he was sort of a modern Mucius. Uh, Mucius, this Roman hero who sacrificed his right hand to the flames, uh, became known later on as Mucius Scaevola. The Latin word Scaevola means lefty, for obvious reasons. The third famous hero that Book Two tells us about uh, is a young woman named uh, Clelia. Uh, she, uh, along with some other young women, had been taken captive by the enemy. They escaped and swam across the river, uh, and uh, the enemy were so impressed uh, by, uh, by, by her that the, they, their admiration for the Romans was elevated. And she also became a famous, um, uh, a famous uh, Roman hero uh, uh, in later Roman song and story. Uh, Hor Horatius uh, was so famous that he, uh, that he popularized the name uh, Horatius, which comes down to history as uh, Horace or Horatio. And you can think of people named Horace, like the later Roman poet. Think of uh, uh, British people with their classical education named, naming their kids Horatio, like um, uh, the guy Horatio Hornblower in, uh, in uh, fictional history. Um, Mucius Scaevola, so far as I know, didn't contribute his name to history. Uh, and neither did Clelia, uh, except that uh, my mother happens to be named that, and we were all very surprised when we discovered the origin of her name uh, uh, as I began studying Livy many years ago. But these three heroes, uh, Hor Horatius, Mucius Scaevola, and Clelia, are, are among the most famous uh, of, the, of the great heroes of ancient Rome. The stories about them were told for generations like we tell children, or used to, up until recently, stories of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, uh, and other, you know, Patrick Henry, uh, Sam Adams, and, and other heroes. Uh, but <clears throat> um, in, <clears throat> uh, in, book, uh, in books two and three, we have one more hero who's even more famous and more important for American history. Uh, his name uh, is Cincinnatus. Uh, Cincinnatus uh, was an aristocrat who served one term as consul. Uh, and uh, at the end of his term, he was so popular, made himself uh, uh, so, uh, so well loved among the Romans that the other aristocrats urged him to, to uh, uh, take another term as, as consul. And he said, well, that's illegal. And they said, nobody's going to oppose you. Go ahead and do it. You do well. It's, it's okay. And, and uh, Cincinnati says, no, it would be against the law. And if I refuse to accept this term of office, it can only, it can only enhance my reputation. So no, I won't do it. And so uh, he, 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 uh, 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 he turns down their offer. Later on, 
uh, his son, uh, a, a young man named Kaiso, uh, gets accused of a crime for which, for which he was probably not guilty. It looks like he's going to be uh, railroaded through the court system in some kind of a kangaroo court, and he's going to be thrown into prison. Uh, there's going to be injustice done. And so the bail that he posted, uh, that put up by his father, Cincinnatus, they agree to sacrifice, and Kaiso flees the country. Cincinnatus loses the bail money in this uh, uh, um, in, in this uh, saving uh, this effort to save his son and becomes poor, but he's preserved his honor. He retires to a little three-acre farm across the Tiber River, uh, outside the city limits. Uh, now it would be right smack in the city of Rome, but back then, across the Tiber was country. He retires to a little farm, and there he hoes his cabbage patch. I suppose it was, along with his wife Rusilia. Uh, one day, <clears throat> uh, the Romans are uh, suddenly discover the danger of uh, the threat of a new enemy, somebody else uh, from outside the country is attacking, and they say, who can we get? Uh, the situation is desperate, it's urgent, we can't count on the bureaucrats and the Senate to, to come up with a good plan, we need somebody to, to, to deal with this urgent uh, emergency right now, and they say, ah, Cincinnatus, we can make him a dictator, and we know that he'll be honest and won't be corrupted by the power that that will, that will give him because he proved his honesty by his earlier actions, including turning down an illegal offer of a, a second term in the, in the Senate as consul. So all the delegates of the city get into a rowboat and they cross the Tiber and they come to Cincinnatus who's hoeing his cabbages. He sees them coming and he tells his wife to run, get his toga and bring it out because the toga is the symbol of a Roman citizen. He puts it on to meet them with sobriety and gravity as a Roman citizen should. And Rosilia brings out the lemonade and the sweet tea. And they sit down and they say, uh, 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 Cincinnatus, here's the problem. We're in emergency uh, status. We need you to be dictator and save the city. Now, um, at this point in history, dictator is an official position that the Romans have come up with, uh, which gives one man absolute power for a limited time of six months. Uh, the Constitution is suspended. Um, all the bureau bureaucracy is cut out. He can do whatever he wants. He has absolute power. Uh, carte blanche, he can do anything he wants, he's not hampered by the normal bureaucratic structures. That's the, the position of dictator. The condition is that the, by the end of six months he has to hand power back to the Senate. So, of course, you can see that much depends on the character of the man you give uh, the dictatorial power to. You don't want to give it to a man uh, who is corrupt because once he has absolute power, why should he give it back? At the end of the six months you can say your term's up and, he, and he'll say, say to you, uh, yeah, who says? So you have to be really careful whom you appoint dictator. Later on in Roman history, the Romans will not be so careful and they will give this position to Julius Caesar and he will appoint himself dictator for life. But here they give this, they, they make this offer of dictator to Cincinnatus and he says, okay, I'll do it. He crosses the river the very next day when he could have slept in late in the presidential palace and drove around a little bit in the presidential Bugatti. Instead, he gets up early, he appoints a master of horse, he rallies the troops and he says, let's go do this boys. And in less than two weeks, he drives out the enemy, complete victory, and then, and here's the important point, he resigns his commission and goes back to his farm. He's a citizen, but he's a farmer. He doesn't lay claim to his power. He goes back to his farm having resigned his commission. He could have kept it for six more months and enjoyed the perks of power, and nobody would have complained. But he didn't. He resigns his commission and goes back to his farm. Now, uh, <clears throat> millennia later... Uh, in uh, the founding of, of America, we have a similar situation. The Americans rise up in, in, uh, in, in, in revolution against the British. George Washington, a farmer from Virginia, is appointed the general of the Continental Army. He carries out the job, and by, the, by 1783, he's defeated the British, and then George Washington resigns his commission and goes back to his farm. Uh, this is commemorated uh, in a number of ways. Uh, the state house, uh, the, the, the state capital of Maryland in Annapolis preserves a room uh, just the way it looked when Washington resigned his commission there. And there's a statue, a sort of mannequin of George Washington holding out in his right hand the scroll on which is written his commission as he gives it back to Congress, returning power to the Senate, not keeping it for himself. Uh, Washington could have kept power longer. Some people say that there was a move to make him king and he said, no, we're, we're going to have presidents. Now, there were people who wanted Washington to have more than one, more than two terms of office, but after two terms of office in 1797, he, he, he retires uh, to set a, a pattern uh, that presidents should limit uh, their time in office. So uh, the State House in Maryland preserves a statue of Washington resigning his commission. 
Uh, secondly, uh, and this is a little bit more fun, if you go to the wonderful old city, uh, city of Baltimore, Maryland, in uptown Baltimore, up on top of the hill in, in Old Town, there's a place called Washington Square. It's a park in the shape of a Greek cross that is a, 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 a cross with equal arms. Uh, on, one, uh, on one side street uh, is one of the most wonderful libraries in America called the Peabody Library, the George Peabody Library. It's an absolutely beautiful library with the many stores of, stories of galleries of books, a beautiful black and white checkerboard floor, and then a glass ceiling. And if you ever go to Baltimore, you should visit it. On another one of the side streets nearby is one of the best uh, art galleries in the East. It's a small private art gallery called the Walters Gallery. It's got a tremendous collection of ancient, medieval, and modern art. But at the center, oh, and on, on, on another corner uh, is one of the, one of the uh, um, great old churches of early America, too. But in the center of this cross is the Washington Monument. Now, it was built by the same guy who would later build the famous Washington Monument in Washington, D.C., the great obelisk that stands 555 feet tall. But the original Washington Monument in, in Baltimore is this column over 150 feet tall, a cylindrical Doric column. A Doric means that the very top of the column, the capital, is plain. There's no scroll work. There's no fancy leaves and vines like, like uh, the Ionic and Corinthian style. And on top, of the, on top of the column, standing, I think, something like 180 feet high, is a great statue of George Washington. Uh, and here's the significant part. In this, uh, in this depiction of Washington, the sculptor has made him standing in a Roman toga, and his right arm is extended, pointing south toward Annapolis, Maryland, which is 30 miles south. He's pointing south to where he resigned his commission, and he's dressed in a Roman toga. And everybody back then had a classical education, and everybody who walked through Baltimore knew what this statue was symbolizing. Washington is Cincinnatus. And they all knew their Livy, and they all knew their Cincinnatus. He did what Cincinnatus did. He did the job as a man of integrity, and then resigned a commission that he could have kept, uh, maybe corruptly. He resigns his commission and goes back to his farm. On the side of the base of the monument, there's, uh, there, uh, there's inscribed the, the, the date of his uh, resigning his commission because that's important. Uh, and if you go uh, up to the very top of the statue, which you can do inside, well, you used to be able to do inside a spiral staircase inside. I think it's closed down now. Um, but um, you get a great view of the city from this Washington monument. Uh, there's another statue uh, that shows just how much the Americans identified George Washington with this old hero, Cincinnatus. Uh, in the capital of Virginia, in Richmond, in the State House, uh, there's a statue that was actually made even earlier. The Washington Monument of Baltimore, I just described, was built between 1815 and 1829. Uh, but there's a statue in the State House of Virginia in Richmond that was built by the French sculptor, uh, carved by the French sculptor named Houdon, and it was built in the 1790s. And it depicts Washington standing uh, with uh, a walking staff in his right hand and a plow symbolizing his agrarian love of the soil, which makes him a patriot, behind him. But on his left side, there is represented the bundle of fasces, the Roman rods of power that, 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 that refer to a political authority and military might. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, sculpture in the State House of Richmond, Virginia, is explicitly meant to depict Washington as the American Cincinnatus. Uh, and you can look this up on the internet, you can go visit Richmond, Virginia, you can see these things. And then finally, uh, the, the, the knowledge in the American founding fathers uh, in, in the early American Republic among educated people generally was, uh, um, uh, of Cincinnatus was so profound that a group of, uh, of men who had been officers in the Continental Army started a society called the Society of the Cincinnati. Now, Cincinnati, for you Latin scholars, uh, you'll, as you'll recognize, uh, is the plural and masculine nominative of the singular Cincinnatus. In other words, it's the Society of the Cincinnatuses. It's a society uh, made up of men who had served in the army and who were devoted to preserving the virtues of patriotism and integrity that Cincinnatus uh, and uh, themselves were trying to preserve. So they called themselves the Society of the Cincinnati and George Washington was one of the original members. Another one of the members, one of the early founders of it, moved to Ohio and founded a city which he gave the name of the society, the city of Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, one wonders how many people who live in the city of Cincinnati, Ohio, know where their name comes from. That it comes from this ancient Roman hero who exemplified, better than anyone else, integrity, patriotism, and real Romanitas, as uh, Virgil talks about it. So uh, these are some examples of how classical knowledge was deeply embedded in uh, the educated people of early America. Not just the elite, but everybody who got an education got an education in these things. 
Well, finally, uh, in book three, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have more stories of these heroes. We have another story about Cincinnatus. Uh, there's one more emergency. He's called back into office as dictator. He deals swiftly and severely with a, with a, a rebel, a senator who, who's attempting to set himself up, at, uh, up as king, uh, attempting to overthrow the republic and restore Rome to a monarchy. And Cincinnatus trounces him and then again retires as an old man to his farm. But time is passing uh, and uh, we see there's more and more trouble between the patricians and the plebeians. The patrician upper class needs the plebeian lower class, which is very numerous, to serve as soldiers in the army. But the patricians keep treating the plebeians badly. Eventually, the plebeians start saying, we don't think we're going to be soldiers in the army anymore. And there's nothing the patricians can do except sort of cave to their demands. So there's this conflict, this tension between the upper and the lower class. This will result in the appointing of the tribune, uh, who is a representative of the commons in the Senate, but it will also result uh, in a new project by which the Romans attempt to uh, establish transcendent law that will help to resolve this, the trouble between upper and lower class. They appoint 10 men at first uh, called decemvirs. Uh, these 10 men, <clears throat> uh, these ten men uh, are, are, are commissioned to rewrite and to codify and to systematize and to organize all of Roman law. Uh, and they, they do this. Now, they're called decemvirs, by the way, from the word decem, which means ten, and vir, which means man. So the, the decemvirs are the ten men. And at first, they do a, a noble job of codifying Roman law uh, into what were called the ten tables. Later on, they added two more. So there's the twelve tables of the Roman law. And the twelve tables of the Roman law were the original founding document of Roman law upon which all the later incredibly convoluted and complicated body of Roman law was built. Just like our modern American body of, uh, uh, body of law, as complicated and convoluted and totally incomprehensible it is to most people, it's still founded on one document, the Constitution, that you can read in 10 minutes. The Constitution is the founding document that we still appeal to, and the 12 tables of the Roman law always remained the founding document that Roman law appealed to. And so the 12 tables of the law constructed by the decemvirs became the foundation for Roman law for centuries. Uh, it was recodified but reaffirmed under Justinian, the Byzantine emperor in the 500s AD, recodified and reaffirmed again by Napoleon in the early 1800s. Uh, and, this, uh, uh, and what became known as Napoleonic law uh, became very common throughout Europe. Uh, France follows Napoleonic law, so does Italy and Spain. Uh, and those Latin countries, um, when, they f when they founded, uh, established their presence uh, in Central and Latin America, established the same body of law. So to this day, Mexico, Central America, and all of South America follow more or less, to some degree, what's called the Napoleonic law, because it was established by countries in Europe that followed it, which is to say that they're still based on ancient Roman law. One of the 50 states in the U.S. also does that, and that's the state of Louisiana. The state legal code of Louisiana is based on the Napoleonic Code, and no other state in the U.S. is. The rest of the, uh, of the state's uh, legal codes are founded on uh, uh, British common law, Northern Germanic, Anglo-Saxon law, and so on. But the state of Louisiana, having been established uh, originally by the French, follows the Napoleonic Code. So we see an enduring presence of the 12 tables of the Roman law as described by Livy, in the entire history of Western civilization's legal understanding. Unfortunately, the decemvirs, besides the, uh, this very uh, admirable project of codifying Roman law, um, uh, fell into corruption. They stayed in power too long, and one of the men, a guy named Appius, uh, was uh, particularly uh, wicked and, and evil. Uh, he uh, 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 he pursues um, lustfully the daughter of a, of a Roman uh, military officer. This Roman military officer comes to the conclusion that protect his daughter from the depredations of this powerful decemvir, uh, he must kill her. So he kills his daughter, uh, and he is praised by the Romans as being willing to do such a thing for the, uh, in, in, in the defense of liberty and against, uh, um, uh, against tyranny. Uh, we would hardly come to the same conclusion. It's very difficult to justify the actions of this man, but he becomes another Roman hero uh, because he's willing to sacrifice now his family uh, to protect Rome uh, against the depredations of tyrants. So by the end of, of uh, book three, we have some wonderful things happening in early Roman Republic history. The development of, uh, of Roman law, the development of its codification in, in actual written code, 
uh, the great heroes of Rome who establish um, for, uh, for, for future generations a model of heroism and patriotism uh, and so forth. But the problems are also building and we're going to see uh, in the next uh, two books uh, of Livy how these uh, struggles between the patricians and the plebeians really start coming to a head. To prepare for the lecture on books four and five of Livy, uh, read them and note a couple of things. I've been talking about the tension growing between the patrician class, the upper class in, uh, in Roman culture, and the plebeians, uh, the common class, the lower class in Roman culture. Watch uh, in book four how this uh, starts really provoking uh, problems and how the Romans deal with it and what Livy, our author uh, himself, says about it. Remember that writing in the first century BC, he's looking at what brought about the decline uh, of integrity and morality in Rome. So look what he says about this conflict between classes. In book five, uh, watch uh, for some uh, very important stories about how, um, how Rome deals with uh, um, uh, invasion by enemies, how she herself is expanding her territory by conquering neighboring enemies. Uh, and uh, one of the famous stories that I'll spend some time talking about uh, is the invasion of the Gauls uh, late in the fifth century. Uh, the Gauls come down from the north, from the region of modern day France, and they invade Rome. It's the first and the last time Rome will be invaded for another at least 800 years but it causes real consternation to the Romans. Uh, watch their reaction to that. There's a famous story about some geese. Watch that as well. Uh, and um, <clears throat> and, and uh, pay attention to how the, Rome, the Romans use all these conflicts uh, to uh, expand their power.